Value Investment Asset Managers Price Value Partners has recently issued a paper under the title Storm Warning that starts with a quote from the 2011 film Take Shelter. Listen up, there's a storm coming like nothing you've ever seen and not one of you is prepared for it. Well, the film addresses compulsive obsessions about mostly the incoming weather, but also other areas of life. Price Value Partners credits this quote, but in context, the reader is asked to consider two storms that look to be brewing for investors. The first is in the bond market, and the second, the entire global economy. This is not even considering the worsening geopolitical environment. We're joined now by Tim Price, one of the authors of the report, published in August, titled Storm Warning. Tim, it's good to talk to you. Thanks indeed for joining us on this podcast. Thanks for the invitation. Explain more about this financial storm as you see it. I think the, the best way to describe it is that we're we're now paying a price for tough decisions that, that could and should have been made back in 2008 but weren't. So if, if you think back to what was happening, what, what precipitated the global financial crisis, it was ultimately to be traced back to the failure of Lehman Brothers. And when Lehman Brothers failed, the authorities had a choice. The central banks of the world, and notably the US Federal Reserve, had a choice. They could have let the, the banking system sort itself out, in other words, let the, the wounded counterparties fail and then rebuild, let the market effectively rebuild itself. But instead, the, the route they took was to intervene and to intervene massively to the tune of trillions of dollars of taxpayer support that were flooded through the system. That meant effectively that the, the market was, was put on life support and a, a problem that was ultimately created by the issuance of too much debt became a problem that's now ho- wholly irreconcilable. So the, the debt mountain just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think we're now in the process of seeing it collapsing. So I think everything can be traced back ultimately to the, uh, the Nixon gold shock of the early 70s when the, the convertibility of the dollar to gold was severed because it was too expensive to keep that, that system going. The cost of the welfare state and the cost of the Vietnam War made it basically meant that the Fed was hemorrhaging gold to other, other countries. And as a result, we've had a monetary system now going back 50 years where uh, the dollar has not been backed by anything tangible and all other currencies in turn have not been have not been backed by anything tangible either. So the whole currency system of the world has been freely floating. And that's encouraged politicians of all shapes to, to borrow more money than they could comfortably afford to maintain. And we are now where, where we are, which is the, I would argue, the end game of the, the, the current manifestation of fiat currency globally. But that, that floating, as you call it, actually gives flexibility, doesn't it? Anybody who remembers the financial crisis 10, 12 years ago will know that governments and central banks can and indeed do step in. They did so for the great financial crisis and they did so over the COVID pandemic. They've written the rules so that they can do this. So surely they'll just step up again, won't they? That process may ultimately test the fiat system to destruction. So that as a value investor, I'm also an advocate of, of hard money. And ultimately, the, the kind of money that I think we should have is, is something that can't be issued without restraint by politicians and their agents in the central banks. The finest form of money, I would argue, would be something like gold or possibly a commodities-backed currency. But when the currency is not backed by anything tangible, it can be issued without any real uh, restraint. And that, that ultimately leads... Voltaire probably said it best when he said that every unbacked currency ultimately deteriorates to its intrinsic value, and its intrinsic value is zero. But as I said, surely there is this this added flexibility. Also, don't forget as well, when you're talking about gold, there's also another option, isn't it, for gold, and that is Bitcoin, digital currencies. This certainly seems the way that some central banks now see the future for whatever reason. Is that going to be the answer? Do you see technology now possibly taking over uh, and making our lives a lot easier? Is that a possibility? I'm all for the use of technology, and I'm particularly for the use of technology in things like politics and voting. So, at the moment, we have the most arcane form of voting and electoral um, involvement in the political process that you could possibly have, which is here in the UK, we elect a government once every five years or so. And that's it. That's all we get to say. What I'm not for is for, as I say, I'm a, a, an advocate of hard money. So I like to think that ultimately money is too important to be left to the state, which will always in, invariably abuse its money creation power. 
Uh, what I'm absolutely not for is for the uh, introduction of central bank digital currency, which would be a, a tool of the surveillance state and would have, I think, dire, dire consequences for people's individual freedom and liberty. Yeah. Uh, look, let's 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 get back to the the, the two areas that uh, your report um, was was focusing in on the, these two storms. First of all, the bond market. Amongst the, uh, the the consumer investment market, bonds are possibly the most misunderstood or little understood area of the market. Explain your fears about the bond market and what's behind what you perceive to be this part of the storm that's brewing. Okay, so I think you're right that the bond market is very misunderstood, if understood at all, by the average retail investor. And that's maybe partly a function of how the financial media operates. So in financial media terms, the stock market gets all the kudos and all the airtime and that the bond market is left left in its wake. But the reality is that the bond market is, is much bigger by value than the stock markets of the world, which is a, a little known fact. And that's indicative of the size of government borrowing over the last five decades or so. So the bond market is a big deal. The, the bond market effectively is primarily the, the, the issuance of debt by governments, but to a lesser extent by corporations and households. It's a big deal because the market, the, the interest rate set by the bond market determines people's mortgages. It determines the cost of corporate credit. So the, it influences basically the, the single most important headline rate arguably in the world is the 10-year government bond yield, which effectively is perceived as being the so-called risk-free rate. And everything is priced ultimately off the U.S. Treasury yield. So U.S. Treasury yield dictates the price of credit in other parts of the, the U.S. interest rate market, they influence the borrowing costs for corporations and therefore for investors as well by way of mortgages. So it's impossible to understate the significance of the bond market. The bond market is ultimately a giant IOU. So it's whenever government can't pay uh, for expenditure and it has to borrow the balance, the bond market is how it finances itself. But because most bonds are basically securities that issue a fixed fixed interest rate every year, fixed coupon as it's called, changes in inflation have a huge impact on bond prices. Changes in interest rates also have a huge impact on bond prices. It would be difficult to overstate just how expensive the bond market has become since the, the 1970s. The, the, the bottom line is that for as long as anyone in finance has worked, interest rates have been coming down. And in as interest rates have declined and inflation's declined and China's joined the world economy, and you've had a huge deflationary effect from that. The, that's been a very benign environment for, for bond markets, for stocks, for pretty much all asset classes. We are now coming off the low in interest rates. Interest rates haven't been this low in all of recorded history. So in 5,000 years, interest rates never got as low as they've been recently. But because that interest rate cycle is now turning up, and we can see the evidence in inflation you know, in front of our eyes every day now, that has some very marked implications for asset prices. In other words, what has worked for the last 40 years is unlikely to work for the foreseeable future. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, much of the inflationary impact is energy prices, isn't it? Fuel prices generally, whether it's to heat our homes or to drive our cars or to dig stuff out of the ground. Is it not a truism to say that if you stripped out that element of inflation, we wouldn't have the problem that we've got? The person I would give credit to who's recently written about this is the, the commentator Constantine Kissin. So he put out a piece on, uh, I found it on Substack um, a few days ago. And I'm just going to quote, if I may, I'll quote very, very briefly from, from Please him. Please do. Yeah. The truth is that the current crisis is not caused by the war in Ukraine and is neither unexpected nor unforeseen. In April 2020, as governments around the world shut down their economies to deal with COVID-19, we interviewed two economic commentators. Dr. Pippa Malmgren and Jim Rickards, when asked what the effects of the lockdowns and associated policies would be, both were unequivocal, inflation. According to the government's own estimates, COVID-related policies cost this country between £310 billion and £410 billion, the equivalent of between £4,600 and £6,100 per person and more than a third of the UK's annual budget, which is just over £1 trillion. The bottom line is that hikes in energy prices are not a function of inflation. Inflation is, as one famous economist once said, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. In other words, the central banks of the world have been printing money without any form of restraint for years now. 
that is why prices of things are going up. But the, the rise in prices is a second order impact. The inflation is the creation and base money that preceded it. So this inflation was always going to happen. The, as, as I think Constantine is absolutely right to say, Ukraine is a sideshow. The bottom line is we are now paying the price for years and years of monetary neglect by the world central bank. Just, just, just quickly uh, give us some context in terms of the mechanics going on here. Uh, as someone that follows the markets and the global economy, you should be able to uh, give some sort of depth on this point. And that is, is that with these prices rising, energy prices will come down at some point. We'll end up bringing them down, I'm not sure. But inflation itself, will it ever come down? And it, will it ever drop down into negative and deflate back to where we were? Or are we now stuck with this forever and a day? For, for how long this lasts is, is, I mean, no one has a crystal ball on this, least, least of all me. But the, I think the problem is that the way the question is framed implies that central banks can do anything about this. Central banks are the cause of this problem and not the solution to it. So if you had interest rates set by a genuine market rather than by a bunch of overeducated PhDs, then the, the system probably wouldn't have got as out of hand as it, as it has done. The traditional response to the, to the inflation argument is uh, the cure to high prices is high prices. In other words, you let the invisible hand of the market work its magic. And there's a book I would cite on this topic, which is one of my favorites, which probably means I should get out more. And it's called 40 Centuries of Wage and Price Controls. And the bottom line of that book is the clue is in the title. Governments throughout all of recorded history have always tried to intervene in the in, in the market, in the in the free market, in, in setting wages and setting price controls. It is never, ever, ever successful, or if it appears to be successful, it will have impacts further down the line on other things that are not successful. The best sim- single example I can cite of this trend is something called the Edict of Diocletian, which took place towards the tail end of the, the Roman Empire. And the Emperor Diocletian was parachuted into office. And, and see if this sounds familiar. So it, it, the empire, the Roman Empire was struggling. It had far too much military uh, overseas. So the cost of the army was spiraling out of control. It had problems with food pr- prices and wheat and grain prices. And so Diocletian issued the infamous edict that carries his name. And one of the instructions in this edict was that grain prices will not rise on pain of death. And you know what? grain prices still went up. This is the power of the market. And it's why the best anecdotal example I can cite for my own career is the September 92 ERM crisis, mm-hmm. when Sterling got, got ethnically cleansed from the ERM. And the, the bottom line is that we entered the this exchange rate mechanism, the precursor to the euro at the wrong exchange rate. So the German economy was booming because they had the inflationary impetus of recent reunification between East, East and West Germany. Whereas the UK economy was in a recession, but we, we had a policy that was explicitly shadowing the Deutschmark. So we had to keep interest rates higher than they otherwise would have been. The reality, of course, is that we got booted out of the mechanism because we couldn't last there. We would have destroyed the economy in the process. So price controls, wage controls, all of these things never work, but they, they happen because government thinks it can control the economy. Short answer, the government is not the economy. The government should not be thinking of controlling the economy. The best thing the government can do is get out of the way. Interesting enough, that was, what, 16th of September. We're almost there. It's almost 30 years ago to the date that we saw the ERM. It's strange as well, Tim, isn't it? Here we are now talking about this um, incoming storm. And September is is a month when all sorts of things have happened, whether it's the Second World War, it's LTCM or Suez or Twin Towers, whatever it is. September, for some reason, seems to attract bad news. So here we are now talking about this and how things are going to develop. Let me just ask you, I mean, we touched on this in terms of the global economy. This isn't another one of the the sort of the, the the problems we were talking about in the introduction that you were highlighting. How do you see the global economy developing? It certainly seems like we're going to go into recession. How deep is it going to be? How high is inflation going to go? And how well are people going to be able to cope with it? I'm a realist. So I'd like to think that we will get through this, but I think it's going to be a very painful period. I remember the last time and around 08, people were saying, what kind of recovery are we going to get? Is it going to be a V-shaped recovery? And being somewhat cynical, I'd say now we're, we're looking at an L-shaped recovery, a capital L-shaped recovery, where, where a lot of wealth is going to get permanently destroyed. It's going to go off to money heaven. We're in a, an energy crisis and a food crisis, both of which to me seem to be somewhat confected. In other words, it's, it's almost as if they're not happening by action, they're happening by design. Whether or not that's true, it, it seems to me we are 
definitely facing a change in the sort of global monetary regime uh, because the old order simply isn't sustainable anymore. And certainly the, 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 econ- the global economy cannot cope with energy prices at their current levels. But this, as I say, this is a largely self, self-inflicted wound. You look at what's happening in Germany and you think, who on earth is in charge of, of, of the government there? They've, they've turned off all the nuclear power stations and they've now issued sanctions against Russia. Are these people mad? It's a, it's an interesting situation that's developed. And of course, the nuclear power thing is a, is a long term sort of political plan, wasn't it? So I guess to some degree, uh, they're paying the price for decisions made uh, pre existing or current um, authorities. So that's a little difficult, I guess. And it's going to take another 10 years before anybody gets any sort of meaningful power in any economy out of new nuclear now. But where we go from here is an interesting question. But you did say earlier that you felt that the Ukraine, the war is a little bit of a sideshow. Geopolitically, is this really the case? How much notice uh, the markets are taking of this uh, special operation uh, in Ukraine? Well, I, I, I'll give you an idea of, of why the, the geopolitical scene is, is just as, is as strange as it, as it seems to be. A friend of mine recently pointed out that the, even at the height of the Second World War, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, which is often called the Central Bank Central Bank, even at the height of the last war, the BIS always respected Nazi foreign reserves held overseas. Now consider that this year, the Biden administration has, I would say, completely arbitrarily sanctioned and frozen and basically invalidated Russian foreign reserves held abroad. At a stroke, the Biden administration has effectively shifted the the tectonic plates of of global monetary relations. It has probably torpedoed the the petrodollar system. It has led to the ruble being effectively a gold-backed currency. It has sent Russia even closer into orbit with the likes of China and the BRICS. It may go down in history as the most self-damaging action in political history. And, And we are complicit in this because the Ukraine is not even a member of NATO. So while we are supporting this corrupt third world basket case, is anyone's question, but it's not something I would I would remotely be interested in backing. And the reason I feel strongly about this is because I think that our media are lying to us about the what is actually happening on the ground in Ukraine. So I don't trust our mainstream or legacy media as far as I can throw it right now. Yeah, uh, certainly this is a, a point of debate. I guess it's away from this po- uh, this podcast, but I want to steer it back to the financial markets and, and get your thoughts on this as a value investor. What yeah. should we be doing? How does value investing fit into this um, situation we're in at the moment? So firstly, let, let's let's agree our terms. So what, what, how do we define value investing? We, we, we would define ourselves as value investors in, after the practice of Benjamin Graham. If people don't know Benjamin Graham, Benjamin Graham was the guy that taught Warren Buffett at Columbia Business School. And I think Buffett was the only member of his class that got an A or an A+. Plus. So Benjamin Graham is, the, if you like, the father of value investing. And his, his approach can be su- summarized very easily. A- don't buy rubbish, and B, don't overpay for the good stuff. So in as much as that informs our investment process, what we're looking, what we've always been looking for and what we continue to look for are basically in, enlisted businesses, businesses that are run by principal shareholder-friendly entrepreneurs, where it's possible to buy the shares of those businesses at a meaningful discount to what we think they're really worth, their inherent worth or, or net asset value. The great opportunity for us at the moment, and this is possibly the most compelling investment opportunity of my career, if not my lifetime, is that just at the time when people ought to be seeking inflation protection, it is being given away in the stock market in the form of listed businesses in the commodities sector. So there's a ratio that we look at with clients, and it's basically the the Bloomberg Commodities Index versus the S&P 500, the the S&P 500 being the US broad stock market. If you compare those two indices, Commodity stocks have not been this cheap relative to the stock market, the rest of the stock market, for 60 years. I find that an astonishing situation, given what's happening in the world right now, and also an astonishing opportunity. Interesting. So the recommendation for your clients and for your management of their money is to look at the commodity sector. You're talking precious metals, you're talking base metals, you're talking agricultural, soft commodities. Where is the most for, value for, or is it across the road? Us, across the board. So for us as value managers, we're driven primarily by bottom-up valuation. So we don't tend to make big macro calls. We do like the precious metals sector specifically, A, because it's the cheapest that we can find 
and B, because we think this 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 global monetary mess is ultimately going to lead to very good returns for people in precious metals, notably the monetary metals, gold, and perhaps to a lesser extent, silver. But it, it's across the piece, so we will happily buy value wherever we can find it. If you look at the, the composition of a typical portfolio for us, it's roughly 40% classic value stocks, another 40% in value stocks relating to the commodities market. And then the balance of portfolios, we use a thing called systematic trend following, which is basically a, a momentum approach, which is hopefully offers a degree of portfolio insurance. But the lion's share of our client assets at the moment are called classic value stocks. And uh, if you like, the least worst way of playing the stock market. But we find the bond market, the reasons previously discussed on this podcast, utterly uninvestable. Yeah. Um, just just to quickly clarify uh, for precious metals and for that sort of area of the market where you're investing at the moment, do you always go for producers or, or do you like uh, the slightly higher potential uh, yielding opportunities that are provided by those that are moving ahead to uh, producing uh, the explorers and the, the developers? No, we, we tend to shy away from the exploration only end of the market because it, it is particularly volatile. And for anyone that's interested in the precious metals market, there's also a sort of hybrid way of playing the gold and silver market in the form of silver, gold and silver streaming royalty and streaming companies. And these are companies that operate in the market, but they don't do any exploration or processing themselves. That is all delegated to a third party. So if you imagine that you're a, say a, a copper a miner in, say, Chile, so someone like Antofagasta, a byproduct of that copper might be some silver, uh, a silver royalty or streaming company, like someone like, say, Franco Nevada or, or Wheat and Precious Metals might well approach Antofagasta and say, look, you've got some silver coming out of this, of this copper mine. We would, like to, we would like to purchase that from you. We will agree uh, in advance a, a, a series of cash flows that will enable you to develop the mine and we'll take the silver at a, at a, at a discount from, the, say, the, the current price in the market. That enables Antofagasta to develop the mine, but enables the company in question, the royalty or streaming company, to secure silver without having to have gone to the bother of actually mining it themselves. So it's quite a nice sweet spot where you, you're, you're playing the precious metals market, but you're not, you're not paying the extra risk for exploration and production. So, so going into this sort of area gives you what protection against inflation. It gives you an opportunity to buy at the bottom, uh, and there seems to be no risk involved. What are the perceived risks in this area of the market? The risk, the, the risks involved in this area of the market is that you know, for no good reason, the shares of some of these companies can fall by fifty percent in pretty short order. They come with all of the sort of the volatility risk attendant in any form of sort of stock market investment. But the, the bottom line is that if you can see through the, the volatility of the short term, if we've done our homework, if we're broadly correct in our thesis that we're about we're at the very early stages of a commodities uh, mega cycle, then we think it's perfectly realistic to expect returns of, of the order of 5x, 10x returns without hopefully jeopardizing too much capital in the process. And do we have to wait too long for that sort of return? It's a fool's game, of course. I know giving any dates or anything, but I mean, are we talking here about a, a fast snapback when things are repaired, however long that takes and whatever damage it does to all of our pockets? When the when the event does happen, are you talking about a fast snapback? Possibly. I think the watchwords we would have would be, it's not so much about trying to time the market. It's just making sure that you're in the market ahead of whenever the, the good times come. The worst thing you could do is try and chase a strong rally once it's already begun. So we, we're quite happy to be maybe a year, even two years too early, rather than being just a day too late. Yeah. Look, Tim, it's a pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks indeed for your time. It's been a pleasure. And um, at Price Value Partners, I know you provide these regular reports. I know that also uh, the meat of them is available on your website. But uh, I'll leave it there. But thanks indeed for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. That's Tim Price, uh, one of the authors of that latest report from Price Value Partners. For more videos from us here at IGTV, join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.